Okay, hi friends, this is Angie and um, Angela Power Disney and Kathy Morgan, uh, with whom I did some co collaborative work back a few years actually. Um, and uh, she's settled in Kerry and I'm in Meath and we're just having a visit. So we could do lots of academic exercises and we probably will from having reconnected for a while. But I thought for this first part, we would just talk about um, uh, MK Ultra survivors and narcissists. So, um, you know, the word girls, boys discos and make up the way you get together. And part of what you just discuss is relationships or the lack of them. And I think a common denominator with MK Ultra or even just child sexual abuse survivors is that the biggest train wreck in their lives is relationships. So um, I'm just gonna ask Kathy to catch us up a little bit. I haven't seen her for at least two years, is it at least two years? So I'm just gonna ask her to, to catch us up on where her life is at. Just come as close as you can for them, because the microphone's in there. Just... Okay, hi. Um... You'll need to talk fairly loud. Are the... we streaming? Now? Yeah, it's, like we're that. not streaming, we're just recording. Uh, oh. And um, when my life set is kind of... You need to talk loud. Are we t well, on the subject of... Anything. Um, Just catch up where, what's been going on for the last couple of years. For the last couple of years, I have um, settled in Ireland from... I was living in North Manchester. And four years ago, I moved to Ireland and I actually live here now. And I live in a very beautiful place surrounded by nature and painting, doing art colours. Stunning um, colors, artwork. I will put a which is piece of Kathy's art really as nice the thumbnail. Change. I'll put a piece of Kathy's artwork as a thumbnail for this and it mm -hmm. is stunning. I'm not just, you'll see for yourself, there's a connection with water and being able to capture water just breathtaking. It was kind of part of a healing programme I was trying to design for myself and um, with, with a lot of help from certain um, researchers online to, uh, looking into CPTSD who have it themselves and very bright. I've been really immersing myself in healing from CPTSD and it's going really well. Yeah, it's complex post-traumatic stress disorder for people that aren't familiar with that term. Which survivors always have. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, um, you know, in discussing, talk to us about this thing that you discovered with the inner critic and the outer critic, because yeah. a lot of the healing yeah. journey is to break programming. Yeah. And the, these kind of programs are not so self-evident. You know, survivors are familiar with um, suicide programming or self-loathing, addiction, destruction, um, and so on, but some of the more subtle inner tapes we were discussing this morning. So talk to us, if you can come as close as you can get, okay. talk to us about the inner critic and then the outer critic, if you can. Well, I was able to entertain from watching hours and hours of um, YouTube because I don't have very much money for books. So um, how the, the approach to healing CP test is identifying um, certain traits in common, one of which is being triggered, of course, the big one is being triggered into um, inappropriate emotions in situations where those emotions don't belong and um, being caused by a complex post-traumatic stress, the sensations are pre-verbal, so you don't understand at first that you don't need to have these triggers and you can avoid them and um, then you kind of can also find where you are, trigger yourself through an internal critic, which is just a mirror of your abuser. And that is standard for anyone who's had childhood trauma to the extent that they develop um, coping mechanisms, uh, responses, which no longer really serve us. So we need to kind of, it's programming, we need to observe ourselves. Once you start observing yourself, this inner critic, it's quite easy to negate and to talk down you, can't, you, you can have an inner dialogue which which re rejects the inner critic 
And then as you start to analyze your relationships, sometimes you observe there's an outer critic, critic which is you vocalizing um, your abusers, criticisms of yourself. You know, this can be as simple as emotional abuse as a child. Yeah, and I, I think that's a good point um, to make that that you don't have to be an MK Ultra survivor or a, a very intensely, severely child abuse survivor in order to be subject to this kind of programming. There's been huge attempts at social engineering to break down relationships, to break down nuclear families, to break down community support structures. So um, this this is relevant for you know a broad spectrum of people and the thing about the inner critic i think most people will recognize so even if you catch yourself in your own talk your own self-talk you it's like oh i'm so stupid look what i've just done or you know trust me to do so and so or i'm useless at blah blah whatever so okay. some you can just like do an exercise with yourself where for a week you don't speak negatively about or towards yourself, but more subtle, when, when we talked this morning about the inner critic and the outer critic, is if we don't want to take responsibility for still running old programs, we can externalize and manifest an outer critic that looks like it's not us. So we can attract a, a, a person of you know a man or whatever into our lives who turns out to be you know it's like oh i don't know where that came from he's awfully critical but it's a it's a manifesting by proxy instead of you know you may have dealt with criticizing yourself internally but you haven't yet realized that you're still attracting critics into your life and into your inner circle you're not putting up boundaries you're not expelling the narcissists and so on. So there's a fatal attraction between empathic survivors and narcissistic abusers until we break that little dynamic and until we say to ourselves, well, I attracted that person into my circle and I embraced and put my boundaries down for. So we're not responsible for somebody else being abusive but we can question ourselves like, okay, where are my boundaries? How long did it take me to give them the boot? How much did I tolerate before, before bailing? You know, so talk, if you can talk a little bit about what responsibility we can take and, and talk a little bit about that. Yeah, you spot on then, Jean. That's a wonderful sum summation because I've been getting a lot of this information from Sam Batman and um, Richard Grannon's channel, which is focused on dealing with particularly narcissism. Um, is and that the guy that's a foreign nationality that specialises in talking about narcissism? Is that the guy or not? Richard Grannon is a Liverpoolian psychologist oh, no, him, who then. runs a very popular um, channel whereby he totally focuses on um, um, recovering from inappropriate responses, um, wow. which is CPTSD, it's complex post-traumatic responses that are still in the present that you don't need anymore. He's very good, but it all links in with CPTSD and narcissism go hand in hand. Because, yeah, I see that. Um, so common to have an, and now this is why when it's interesting in terms of programming because people who have got MK ultra red flags in the background find the narcissists that come into the lives are also linked to MK ultra. Yes, and this is where you question: Is it a handler? Are they sent in? Uh, is there an agenda? And the difficulty, the difficulty in establishing the truth of that is that there seems to be vast amounts of MK ultra survivors. Uh, who quite frankly are and have been assets, but they're not on any salary. It's like Holly Baglio says, you know, I want my salary, you know, and, and my health benefits and my pension. You know, if I've been used so nefariously and so surreptitiously, where's my salary? So there, there's this generation or two of MKH survivors who have still been used and sent in on others and uh, moved around on chessboard by an invisible hand. But 
if you throw around accusations like he's an agent or he's an asset, it, you kind of neutralize that by saying no, but he's broke, or if he was, he'd have plenty of money, or uh, you know, he's not on any government wage remuneration package or so on. But this is just a duping thing, and um, it, we do, we do, you know, depending on where we're at with our healing journey, we do tend to attract handler types, not just narcissists but wounded in ways that we recognize. And this was something else we discussed this morning was there's an attraction. I've got a theory about your brain pathways being diverted through trauma when the brain is in the formative, you know, first seven years, seven to 12 years, when your brain pathways are forming and the brain's still growing, if you endure ongoing chronic trauma during that time, a side effect, and, and definitely, I don't recommend this to anybody, but a side effect is diverted brain pathways which accesses different variations of genius. So it might be photographic memory, it might be psychic abilities, it might be, um, you know, autistic qualities, uh, or I've got audio um, photographic memory. I, I, can, I can reproduce conversations and the exact intonations and so on i've got an audio um, so um and then when we see that in somebody in somebody of the opposite sex there's an attraction because there's that mental acuity that mental gymnastics which is was never meant to be accessed through trauma and torture um but you'll you'll recognize it amongst the elite they'll share what looks like a quick wittedness or a a tendency towards genius and you think oh yes that's attractive i'm i'm like that not realizing that your your woundedness is is interacting with their woundedness so let's let's kind of explore that a little bit more just stay it's close extraordinary it's extraordinary because our research in terms of our own um looking into social engineering and trying to sort of spot it in our own lives as leading um, some of us researchers that are called working together to look at um, how delinquency was exploited um, by Tavistock um, and the children's homes and how they link in with Dr. MK Ultra Doctors um, um, indeed the establishment as the establishment really does and um, therefore we feel that in some sense some I <laughs> I wonder about the cybernetic Macy conferences and how they were already programming electromagnetically ponds full of algae to do certain behaviors as a whole. And, and so I wonder about programming um, and the way that we do attract these people in unconsciously into our lives. It, it's quite mind blowing, but bearing in mind where Angie and I were living and the kind of things that might have gone under with the supercomputers were actually based there. So it's quite high level um, units around us. So God, goodness knows, you know. Um, yeah, so we're really finding this very helpful because people are doing a lot of research into healing from CPTSD, it being so widespread. It really is, and that's, that's something to just remind ourselves that it, uh, side profile, don't show, you know, whatever you do, don't do a side profile. <laughs> we're both 61, you know, and we're unabashedly still whistleblowing and still um, surviving and recovering. And we just, you know, we have plenty of academic um, information to update on, um, together with another survivor from the UK who's already a published author, um, but has asked us to bring forward some of her research at this time for di different reasons um, and we'll be happy to credit her with with that research as and when she's able to put her name to it but the research is tying up more and more and Bath still remains a hub oh gosh I'm so sorry I'll let you take over for a minute okay. Hello. Yep. A research in Bath um, as a hub, yeah, because as uh, Angie and I were both in the same school system, system in Bath, the Catholic um, 
Jesuit school, I say, a uh, headmistress there. I, I was in the final year of the June of the junior school and Andrew was in the first year above me at the Conlen. So um, that led us to take notice of Bath and we also noticed Bristol was quite a hub of population studies at the time and there was a eugenicist um, flavor um, hub, hub of people meeting, um, hobnobbing together and there's been some interesting links around that organization. Yeah, did you talk about the, the one I mentioned to you that came up a few days ago? What was that? The Bath Institute. No, uh, it was that charity. Oh, Designability. Designability. We've got some very interesting leads on that and connections to Sarah Fillimore, solicitor, uh, resident in Bradford-on-Avon, now moved to Plymouth, Big Buddies with Karen Irving, and previous apparent enemies with Barbara Hewson. Q see so we're getting some really um it's all linking up it's linking up to finchley road it's linking up to the Hampstead case it's linking up to the bath studies and the bath um, hub of uh, social engineering and uh mk ultra really to be honest caution computer center rudlow manor which is being um allocated to gchq as a satellite uh, base for that. Um, we'll we'll wait and see if that manifest, you know, if that turns out to be true. But that's pretty good intel. So um, getting back down to brass tacks, um, can you go through just in generic terms how one would get involved with a narcissist? There's a meme that I saw which I loved, which is a woman saying to a guy. I've made a red. I've made a lovely scarf out of all the red flags I had with you, <laughs> and you see this floor length. You know there was this red flag, there was that red flag, there was this red flag, there was this red flag, and I've made it into a lovely scarf. So, but we downplay that. But in actual fact, it's a path of ongoing self-destruction, and also has impact on our families and our loved ones because we literally get paralysed and debilitated from this past programming running of being drawn to handlers uh, or fellow victims of MKUltra or just plain old narcissists. <coughs> so can you talk a little bit just in generic terms of the whole, because you said the last relationship literally nearly killed you. Literally nearly killed me. Yeah, I went down to work. I lost stones in weight and, and I just came back stronger. I just found but stay it. Stay in the presence of before we go about the recovery because you've clearly recovered and you've come back. Okay, so this an person artist, but describe if you can. You don't have to the go details. The link to MKL to start was phenomenal because he, he was very close with someone listed on the S N M page as one of the founders, and he was like sidekick and work. What's S N M? S N M Institute. Oh, the S N M Institute in California. It just so happens in Ireland. I meet bump into his. And acknowledging one of his books by name, etc. But you know, I'm just, I just think it's just amazing that I was studying MK Elder and then I had happened to attract someone. I don't even know that until after I finish with him, actually. Which makes you wonder again: is it a sent in person, or are we acting on a, are we acting on a default program where we find each other? I'm sure it's more of a default thing, feels more of a default thing most of the time. You know, I think you get a different sensation if someone is live, kind of sent into you. I feel you would, would be more obvious. And what would, how would you describe the dynamic? And I've been, uh, I've done this to myself many times too. How would you describe the dynamic of, you almost know immediately that this is a narcissist or this is a, a survivor or a wounded one, but you override it. Can you can you explore that dynamic a little bit where you don't listen to yourself? Oh my god! <laughs> when I can, when I, I come, like, like, let me know when I find out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I talked about one way I managed to defuse that. It was a cycle for me of keep having disastrous relationships and then 
realizing with hindsight, it's like that guy was so cut out, predictably, uh, you know, a handler, and not not real not realizing or not being willing to realize that till afterwards. And one clue I found, which is not for everybody, but for me, I decided not to get intimate, even if I had all the symptoms of being in love, um, not to have sexual intercourse, for me was a, a powerful self-protection tool. And it's not that I am, you know, committed to celibacy for the rest of my life, but I just have a very simple boundary. It's like it, if I am at this stage of my life, if I'm going to commit again, body and soul, which is for certainly for the female, you give your soul in the intimate act of sexual relationships, um, then it's going to be, you know, in a committed, in a committed way. So I talked about a German Deutsche Bank employee being sent in on me and, um, you know, all the red flags were there, but I fell in love nonetheless, quote unquote, but I held back from the intimate side of things. And therefore, within about two months, I was able to flush out his real agenda and his real limitations. And, uh, you know, other than being a bit upset for a couple of weeks, I was able to recover much faster than if I had gone along with the illusion that oh this is it and he's the one and we let's move yeah. in together and introduce him to the children and everything's going to be wonderful and so it's not a very nice you know we've been socially engineered into if it feels good do it and you know intimacy is a healthy part of life and so on but uh, for me that that was something that stopped the cycle of keep getting into abusive relationships Suddenly, independently, I also decided to have a period of celibacy where I could specify that. And the, the amount of programming, other people's programming, I didn't get caught up in anymore was, it was such, so relaxing, you know, because you're trying to set, second guess. Sometimes you don't know what people's agendas are. They have to use any, um, that, that kind of programming in you. Somehow it, it's weird, but once I said celibacy, all my relationships were clear cut. I wasn't concerned anymore, you know, about people's trying to decide for people's true intentions. It didn't matter then, I could just be me, you know. Yeah, <laughs> and talk about the thing as well, because I've done this and I'm sure so many people listening have, where you lose your real self in a relationship. Here's a red flag with hindsight. So, Kathy was describing this. How long would you say that relationship lasted? Six months. Six months, but very intense and very destructive, and huge recovery that Kathy we, had. We kind of merged immediately. <laughs> it's that it's symbiosis. But symbi symbiotic relationships well, are where you there. lose each other, and nobody's fully themselves anymore. It's like the combination of two people in in what's not a uh, a healthy way talk about how you lost all your sense of who you were and your talents and your academic pursuits and your you were just this cooking oh no i don't want to really go into any more details about that particular okay. relationship because okay. it is still in my soul can you talk just okay i understand that i understand that you know, but the fact is it absolutely fits the uh, the pattern that We've just referred to. Can you talk generically about when, because so many people, myself included, lose a sense of who you are because we're programmed to so uh, merge with the other person. And a lot of us have people pleasing uh, programming. So we'll cook and we'll be, I was in my marriage, I tried to be the perfect wife, the perfect mother, the perfect church person, the perfect everything. Um, and totally lost who I am. So what's the difference between being in a relationship and losing who you are and then coming out of the torment and recovering from nearly dying and so on. And then you discover this ability to paint, which is off the charts which is left brain coming to life. Can you talk about that? <laughs> I, I can't even explain what happened. I was so um, committed to something 
within myself that I couldn't contact through through my outward experiences or my my um, left brain is that the one like the analytical brain. So as, I, as soon as I allowed myself to paint, it was like a lot of healing took place because I I was doing something else. Phenomenal. So it wasn't trying to rationalise your pain or your recovery. It was you just discovered a self discovery, uh, a self expression tool. Somehow, I just got so triggered and program um, so triggered um, in the relationship. It was so intense that um, I kind of lost control of what was happening, if you like, and um, the trauma of um, you see. One thing about the people pleasing and the fawning is it's just one of the four trauma responses, which is fight, flight, fawn, or freeze. Wow. And people pleasing is one of the um, wow symptoms of CPTSD, as they all are. Now, the ones that are CPTSD and um, codependents find hard to really admit is that we also have fight in yeah. there, and that, okay. that can be triggered without us wanting. The fall or freeze, I've never heard that, and that is so out. Explanatory, because these guys have been doing a lot of fresh research into this area, and it's phenomenally helpful, and they're putting it out for that reason, too. And so there's two, um, Rankin himself is a narcissist and who's, who publicized the whole, um, he's the first person to come out and publicize, there was a documentary about him, but he's teamed up with um, Richard Grannon, who's, um, who put, who put a lot of uh, coaching and, and uh, analysis out. He's very bright and he explains it in a very accessible way for normal people. Kind of thing. <laughs> Do you know, he's very funny with it. And um, yeah, he's worth Spartan Life Coach. Definitely recommend. It's, but yeah, it's, I followed him for a while and then I got offended with something he said. I can't remember what it was, but it, it offended uh, well, me, so I pulled There's many back. resources out there. He's just one example of all the different, not everyone. Narcissism is, is everyone. one of the uh, maladies of our century, you know, and it, and uh, there are there are very successful YouTube channels out there. There's another guy, he's foreign, I can't remember his name, but he, he is a fully self-admitted narcissist, and, um, you know, he, he does some great work. He's published books. But in some ways, it's regarded at some level as incurable, which is a bit sad, a bit, you know, a bit of a lifetime injury from childhood trauma. Um, well, Sam Wagner is a therapist who has devised some cold therapy for actually, um, it's not incurable, he says, and it's actually another a, a symptom of CPTSD. The actual okay. narcissist is also in that cycle. Of CPTSD, it's quite it's from the the new work that has been you know the new insights into this is very interesting. Now. Yeah, Definitely. because I I've had relationships where the the man has been hugely attracted to my independence and my fearlessness. So, for instance, I I when I walked away from my marriage in two thousand and one, um, I was this incredibly capable. Uh, you know, I, I rolled up with a Jeep and a horse box. I had, you know, I always say I had three horses. No, I had four horses, three children and a dog. <laughs> and, um, you know, and so I was just this incredibly capable, you know, and I was so thrilled to be free from a marriage which was engineered. And I'd done everything I could to submit to and, and you know, embrace and rationalize and so on. So, so when I actually it disentangled myself after a decade or more than a decade, I, I had three children, four horses and a dog, you know, um, and I had to start again. But I, I met somebody who was hugely attracted to my independence and strength to, you know, turn that adversity into something beneficial. But once I got involved with him, I became this helpless, fawning, such a good word, helpless, fawning, people-pleasing, sub overly submissive, and um, just needy person, unrecognizable, unrecognizable. 
And I remember him saying to me accusingly, like, where's that strong, independent woman that I fell in love with? And I'm like, I don't know, I've mislaid her. <laughs> I've lost her. And it's literally a healthy relationship should make you more of who you are. So in an ideal world, in a healthy relationship, Kathy wouldn't have needed to almost go under in order to discover yet another talent, which is this phenomenal art. You know, and we were saying, is there not an easier way to access latent gifts other than getting a broken heart? <laughs> you know, so... Um, Which, you know, even they were mad about when they found out that Pavlov found out that the drugs, all the programming of the drugs broke down when they were traumatised, when they had a trauma. So trauma has the uh, effect, as they well know, of uh, breaking down previous programming. So it can... Wow. Yeah, it's... Interesting. Something else I discovered about that, and I've discussed it with Dan Duval. I, I engaged with his bride movement, bride ministries. You know, they sponsored DID counselling for me, and still do periodically. And I, we discussed, or I discovered along that journey, was that I kept manufacturing drama in my life because the early life trauma that was the only way my body knew to release serotonin and dopamine and, and so on. I'd got trapped in a cycle of, I have to have a drama because then I'll get these chemicals going off and I'll know I'm alive and I'm still, you know, yeah. And so once I realized that I was just remanufacturing drama because it was my supply and I didn't know another way to access feeling alive, and so as soon as I identified that I was, and this is a, the same thing I'm saying again about if we've, analyzed, if we've identified our inner self-critic, but we haven't quite yet got a handle on the external self-critic, and we don't want to take responsibility for that, so we keep manifesting people that are hugely critical towards us. But once you cop on, you don't have to reproduce that. So would you say... Because at 61, I've kind of almost given up on being ever having the tools to have a healthy relationship. And I'm fine with that. Like, I'm, I, I can be just content on my own. And if I had a relationship, I'd like to think I would have a good support system that would say to me, don't go there. You know, you've got red flags everywhere. Hold back, have some boundaries, blah, blah, blah. You know, and people that I would trust. But... Would you say you're any better equipped from, from say, for instance, whichever, say in the last five years, when you go on a learning curve, no matter how painful it is, and you come back stronger, do you think it equips you any better? Or are we still in the hamster wheel? Well, I think most, you have to what equips louder. you is actually if you've got some stability in your life and you're in a community, yeah. because then you can take time and wait and see but if you're constantly moving from place to place and mm. you don't have then those roots are gone so you're having to take chances and without the I the, think it's very clear that homelessness chronic poverty external targeting any kind of profound instability is not your friend it's not a friend to healing it's not and I've noticed um, that when people in crisis, for instance, are housed, if you observe them for two or three years, they can find such stability that they can actually go back to education or go through counselling or somehow break some of those cycles. But I think Kathy's hit on something there by saying if you're homeless or transient uh, or unstable, you know, uh, the chances of getting your healing underway is not great. You could almost, somebody could almost predict what kind of person could attract you if in, in the circumstances. Yeah, with, with if they seem, kind of and that goes traumatic back Traumatic background. If they seem, you mean you'd attract I mean, somebody equally traumatised? Yeah, they could. I've, I've been documenting social engineering, which has happened on a wider and wider scale that from what I can see, you know, from eugenics studies um, and I've come to believe that some people do have people sent into their lives either intelligence or in other ways in other kind of studies 
So um, we've oh, often joked about be having people sent in when their oh, relationship goes crazy. It's no joke at all. It's 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 um, you know it's you almost laugh. I couldn't cry. <laughs> You, you almost need like a radar to see is this another handler? Do you know what I mean? It's like we're getting ways. <laughs> you know, and I've got a tick list like any connections to CIA, any connections to GCHQ, exactly. any connections <laughs> to the military, any bloodline, any any childhood trauma, any uh, blackouts, any uh, highly developed uh, abilities which seem mysterious. We any, find each other. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, and uh, it, it's questionable whether two MK Ultra or child trauma affected adults can it find a way to healthiness together i don't know i don't know the answer to that but i realize now i, I need to find the healthiness in myself it's quite it's almost like having a relationship now where i've come to <coughs> that way you know uncovering new aspects and, like that. and that's what was brilliant when you said the inner critic and the outer critic and i and we listened to harold Kautz Vella this morning and he was talking about you know, that we need to find the trauma in ourselves, and we need to find the, the, the darkness in ourselves and heal it and so on and so forth. And my point is that's true, but if we never get a social conscience along with that, we can just become narcissists. Narcissists attached to, uh, instead of being overtly narcissistic, say for instance, of being consumer, you know, money driven or possessions driven, you can still be a narcissist driven to self healing. If you don't balance it, of course you have to heal yourself. And then the overflow of your own healing will show up around you. But if it's all about, I can't, I can't help anybody else because I'm healing myself. That's my contribution. That's the new age. Y yeah, the absolutely. Impact programming is precisely hijacking that ability to brilliant to get everyone to focus ex exclusively exclusively on, on themselves, themselves, and then and then it becomes just and then you can just parallel play with another narcissist that's devoted to the same pursuit of self-knowledge it's it i suppose that was embodied in the 60s wasn't it with everybody going off to india to see a guru you know and meanwhile being lousy husbands and lousy parents or whatever so so there's a middle pathway there's a middle pathway with that so let's just see if we've covered we talked about some of them are sent in definitely if you're mk ultra and uh you are sent in upon there's no doubt about it, it, it i think if both of us took notes on what we thought were previous boyfriends, you know, there'd be a checklist that would go check, 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 check. You know, whether they are conscious themselves of being, yeah. um, some of them are and some of them aren't, you know. Um, and uh, so there is the sent in thing, but there also is this, who am I attracting into my own space? Who, who's coming and reflecting my own woundedness and what would it take for me to have boundaries that would say ah, ah stop stop red flag red flag back off not going there um you know it's it's the quandary of the human race it's not good for man to be alone but at the same time an awful lot of survivors just abuse survivors or mk ultra trauma survivors a lot of them opt to stay alone just because this programming is so intense isn't it it's so it's i love that thing you said which is fight or flight fawn or freeze that that adds a whole new element to it so we'll we'll do some academic um you know we've got stuff to report on that's absolutely nuts and bolts screen share this is connected that's connected here's the you know the kind of work we did which just had an awful lot of acknowledgement but we just wanted to sit down and do this just touch base uh, thing on, and I don't want to leave it negative. What's, what good can be said about what we've learned? We can't, oh, well, if we can't pass any wisdom on what, what hope is that there? that kind of um, reflection on complex post-traumatic stress is talk, so talk helpful to the survivors. Um, for it was for me and anyone else I'm talking to, there's people coming to see me who've been involved in satanic ritual abuse and they're reading the same book the, the cptsd book about getting in touch not repressing your feelings allowing those feelings to come out grieving those past 
traumas that enable that program to latch in and anchor in it's a lot of it's about body work and it does translate into leaving you more of a clear channel to be more of an activist it doesn't you know the idea is to distract yourself from from that yeah yeah that yeah that that is that is true and and i think um we talked about unexpressed anger where many of us certainly of our generation were not allowed to express anger and so um you know there's different platitudes which are based in truth which is depression is just unexpressed anger turned inward or you know pain in the back or back issues is the back is the seat of, of, of uh, repressed anger uh, try not to get new agey here because everybody knows i'm christian and i believe in supernatural healing but there is much to learn in in learning the the abcs of what's going on so um and also under the anger you often Fear. fear, yeah, yeah, fear, yeah, genuine yeah, fear absolutely. for your life as a child when you're abandoned for hours and nobody's responding to your cries, etc. Absolutely, but sometimes it just takes that final trauma as an adult to really for it to hold. And really there are safe pain. ways to express anger. Um, one of my favorites, I haven't done it for a few years, but one of my favorites is to get some old junky plates from a charity shop or somewhere and then find a safe space to smash them against the wall. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's like it's, and then I go and sweep it up impeccably and make sure there's not a shard left. But there's something. There are safe ways, um, you know, to express anger and and sadness and the kind of feelings that are um, not so socially acceptable. It's crucial. One part of healing is to understand that you don't have to respond on those feelings in the moment, and that you can take the moment and. and find out what's going on so it helps them yeah because i get a delayed anger i i i very rarely allow myself to be angry in the moment but i'll go home and think oh, what was that and then i'll process it and then i'll get in my own safe space of my own home then i'll get the emotion of anger and it might mean i'll write a letter of complaint or i'll take some action or whatever but i, I find that anger isn't appropriate that's when you may feel shame, but also these feelings of shame, anger that aren't appropriate, that's what will take you into clearing where those, it has been triggered from the past. So that's still in you, the program. So it's very helpful to do that, it's absolutely. To express it in a safe space, you mean? Yes, and, and then find out where it's come from, if it wasn't appropriate. Okay, if yeah, it yeah, yeah. If it was a, like, yeah. not appropriate at the time. Yeah, because the other question to ask yourself is if you're feeling rage, or overwhelming sadness or some profound emotion sometimes it's worth tracking okay what triggered me and it may not be that something that happened two hours ago it may have just reminded you of something that happened 20 30 40 years ago so that's worth you know that's worth tracking as well so we're not trying to be this is if you have cptsd this yeah complex kind of post-traumatic stress disorder which is um you know, it's a name, it's a label, there is supernatural healing, but sometimes we have to walk out the healing. You know, it says, um, even in the scriptures, it says, walk out your own salvation. You know, it's a daily, you have to get out of bed, you have to do what you've got to do, you've got to deal with uh, obstacles and frustrations and tribulations and persecutions and, you know, disappointments and so on. But I just want to congratulate Kathy on the... Um, you know, not just coming back, uh, but coming back with a whole new self-expression in her artwork, which is just stunning. And um, yeah, we'll 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 do we'll follow this up with some academic work. But we just wanted to touch base. Girlies in the kitchen. <laughs> God bless. Anything else before I end this one? I think that that was good. No, I think that's a nice note to, uh, to end. All right, Kathy Morgan. How can people contact you? If they want to, can you be contacted or are you still in a private space? <laughs> I'm, I'm on Facebook. Yeah, you'll see me on Facebook. C-A-T-H-I, Morgan. And I'm Angela Power Disney. I'm on Facebook when I'm not banned. Or I've got a blog, Angela's Cashes, a website, angelascashes.org. No apostrophe. And Cashes is C-A-C-H-E-S. We'll be following up on this. Oh yeah, I've got a YouTube channel with some of my um, presentations and interviews. Some great on a playlist on my channel. Yeah, some great work on a playlist. Do check that out. Um, 
some of our work has been used in international inquiries. Um, you know, Kathy's like we share experientially. We were in similar programs. We were in the same Jesuit programming schooling system and so on. So we share experientially like we're doing now. And then, and then we find the research and the, it, it, it's all there, isn't it? Yes, we came up with all sorts of ideas about how, why this happened and what was going on. And then when we did the research, it's Absolutely coming, corroborated what... it. It was mind blowing. It was mind blowing. And even Kathy was saying on this visit, everything that we suspected and ex explored has been totally corroborated and validated. The, the evidence has backed. It's not that we, it's not that we found evidence and imitated it. We shared experiences and then found the evidence that corroborated it, which is very comforting. So yeah, God bless all. Um, what to expect here? We'll elaborate more on that. We later. will definitely <laughs> do more of these, but we wanted to touch base because our time together is nearly gone. <laughs>